I found college very hard. I found it hard academically because I had not been prepared well. My county was the worst county in the state of Virginia at the time. I, d I don't think I even had a biology lab. So when I got to college and I uh, was thrown in with students who had had a very superior um, education, I decided early that if I was going to survive, I was going to have to work three times harder. Three times harder? Oh, yeah. And I, um, I did. I, I, I had a lot of catching up to do. Growing up in a rural Virginia county where a few high school students went on to higher education, Betty White and her six siblings all graduated from college. Now, as head of school at Sacred Hearts Academy, her goal is to make sure that her students receive an education that will prepare them not only for college, but for life. Betty White, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Betty Orr White, who is head of school at Sacred Hearts Academy, started her journey at this all-girls school in Kaimuki as a social studies teacher. While being an educator has been both her career and her passion, she didn't start out wanting to become a teacher. Growing up in a rural county in Virginia in the 1940s and 50s, she was one of only a small handful of graduates in her high school class who left home to pursue higher learning. I understand that you grew up in one of the poorest areas in the country. I did. Where's that? I, I didn't know that it was poor until I'd left and gone to college. It was in the, what we call Southwest Virginia. It's in the, the 35 degree triangle where Kentucky and Tennessee meet. And if you're on the eastern side of the state, you have Washington, Alexandria, Richmond, the big cities. And they had uh, metropolitan areas, uh, good school systems. Now in Southwest Virginia, we had um, something like 98 counties. My county was Lee County, and that was named for Robert E. Lee. And it was the poorest county in the state. And one of the biggest poverty pockets in the whole country. But you say you didn't feel poor. I didn't. I didn't know. I really didn't know I was poor. Um, and and I, I, I won't I won't say the word poor, but very humble, uh, very humble upbringing. Um, the area is noted for, for timber, for coal mining, for um, having big cash crops. At that time, it was tobacco. And um, I had a very, a very loving, secure family. And our, our daily needs were met. We didn't go to the supermarket much. We had our own gardens. We had pigs. We had, uh, a, we killed a cow every year for beef. We had our own chickens. And our summers were hard because we had to tend that garden. And Leslie, it seemed, even now, it seems like that that garden was at least an acre. You'd uh, green beans, corn, uh, tomatoes, and at that time we didn't have a freezer, so we would um, we'd call it canning them in a pressure cooker. So it was. I can remember sitting and and breaking four bushels of beans in one sitting. My parents were um, they were not college educated. They were um, back in Southwest Virginia. They would be called humble, good country folk. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my father went into the army at an early age, picked up uh, auto mechanic skills, and then was able to open his own automotive mechanic shop. My mother was a coal miner's daughter, and she, uh, she lived in a coal mining camp. That's where she grew up. Such a good woman. She um, was never able to go to college, but
but she was such a beautiful cook. She sewed our clothes for seven children, never had a pattern. And um, she, she loved country music. So did she uh, like the song Cold Miner's Daughter? Oh yeah, on a Saturday night or on, you know, when we didn't have uh, book work, she would she played a guitar. And um, oh, she would she would sing for hours with us. And I had a couple of sisters that were also good singers. I wasn't a good singer, but we had real real good times. When I went away to college, I I saw a completely different side of my hometown and the area in which I lived. After Betty White graduated from high school, she went on to higher learning at Mary Washington College, the women's division of the University of Virginia. Even though she didn't leave the state, her college was a world away from Lee County. Yet it wasn't until she read a book in her freshman year that she realized just how far away and how different her community was on the other side of Virginia. Was it an assumption in your family that you would go to college? No, no. Um, I was one of seven children, and we all ended up going to college. But I think it was, it was, there was never any pressure from our parents to go to college. It was just our own inner drive, our own inner ambitions to go to college. And they supported you in that? Um, they supported us emotionally, but, um, at that time, one could go to college and they could, they could um, work their way through. So you, you were going to college with what intention? What was the plan? Did you have a plan as a young woman? I, I'm not so sure. I don't ever remember having a plan. I just wanted to go to college. And so I graduated in a, in a class of 51 students. So out of that 51 students, about 20 to 25% went to college. And I just wanted to be one of them. So, so um, I cannot remember thinking that I wanted to be a teacher. And I think maybe that that happened because at that time the state of Virginia had a scholarship. They wanted teachers. So they would give a, a quite a lucrative scholarship to those that were going into education with the idea that you would give back a year of teaching for every year you got the scholarship. So I needed the money. <laughs> I needed the money. So that's what I did. I studied political science. Even in graduate school, I studied government. So. So I was taking education courses just on the side because my parents did not have uh, the money, the financial resources to help us. So with seven children, we needed, we needed the scholarships. Where did you go to college? Well, I went to college in um, Fredericksburg. So you went? Uh, I went to all the, the way city across area. the state. Mm -hmm. All the way across the state. I always traveled by Greyhound bus. How long did it take you? How long were those about rides? About a, a good a good trip was about twelve hours. And you rode alone. I rode alone, and I always rode behind the driver. Right. So um, at that time, uh, Mary Washington was the ladies' division, the women's division of the University of Virginia, and um, I will never forget um, in one of my freshman courses. One of our required readings was a book called Night Comes to the Cumberlands. Of course, they're talking about the Cumberland Mountains, the Cumberland Gap, mm -hmm. where Daniel Boone and David Crockett came through. And um, I sat in class and I thought, this is, this is talking about me. This is talking about my area. <laughs> and I, it was a whole different, um, a different mindset after that. Be because uh, what did the book say about your area? Well, it, um, what, what, um, what the author did was um, the insensitivity to the land, the insensitivity to the environment. Of course, poor, 
not a lot of not a lot of wealth in the area, but one of the most beautiful areas you could ever visit. But big companies had come in, cut the timber down. And you mentioned coal mining. Coal mining was big. Coal mining was sort of king. And they not only, you know, did went under the earth, but they also coal mined from the from the surface. And it's called strip mining. And they just raped the land. And you saw that as jobs for people in the neighborhood, but well, but it's even more than that. Um, the biggest the biggest part of it was several several valleys over, and I didn't even know what was going on. After I read the book as part of my required freshman reading, I remember going home at Christmas, and I was very interested in driving through, and I saw you know all the erosion of the land where they had cut trees down, dug into the earth's surface. Environmentalists today would have a, a, a heyday, you know, criticizing how insensitive the people were to the environment. Did it make you look differently at the people with whom you grew up and the way you grew up? Uh, I, I think I became a bit more humble, a bit more understanding. Um, but see, never, never, um, Never a lot of money, but we had enough to get by. We, um, we always had a lot of love uh, in our family. The, the significance of a family was first and foremost. Um, my parents were very strong on a faith-based family. Following college, Betty White attended graduate school at the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. That was where she met Emmett White, a law student who soon became her husband. After he graduated, Betty moved with him to Hawaii, where he started a law practice. It was the first time she would experience cultural diversity. You lived in what I assume was a pretty much an all-white neighborhood when you were growing up? Definitely. So no, not a, no diversity of no uh, diversity. race? They all look just like me. And those were, t when you were growing up, those were uh, times of segregation. So there were bathrooms for African Americans only. Segregation, although it was illegal, was definitely still happening. So on the buses, I was always a little afraid. And so I always sat behind the driver. But I remember so well the black people having to go to the back of the bus. We, we always had stops in Richmond, Virginia. And um, you're going to the bus terminal. This would be a Greyhound bus terminal. And they had the um, uh, water fountains. You had to go to a particular water fountain, a particular bathroom, and even to get little snacks. They had special ones for, for black people and special ones for white people. Now, was that something you became accustomed to because that's all you all you knew? And I, I became accustomed to it because I'd studied it, right? But but I'd never lived in that type of of an environment. And then on a college campus, both campuses that I attended in Virginia had very few black people. It was mostly whites, Caucasians. What was it like coming to Hawaii with all of, with no one having a majority in terms of uh, race? You know, the, the thing I remember about coming to Hawaii has to do with a cousin who um, was quite a bit older than I was. And um, I guess he was in the Korean War. And he married a Chinese lady. And he brought her back to Virginia. She was the most beautiful person, uh, you know, kind, generous. But I will never forget when I saw her and her slanted eyes. I'd never seen a, an Asian or an Oriental person. And then when my husband and I moved here, we saw plenty of Asians, right? And so then I happened to see this cousin-in-law again. And I didn't notice her eyes at all because, you know, she blended into the environment here. So you had no trouble uh, acculturating and getting used to everybody, getting to know other people's cultural mores? Not, re not really, not really, no. 
it, it, was, um, it was certainly a learning process. And it's still a learning process even today because there's, there's so many diverse groups. But um, take it in stride. How did you get to Hawaii? Well, my husband had gone to undergraduate school at Lafayette College in Eastern Pennsylvania with a young man from Hawaii. And they, I believe they'd even been roommates. And um, after they finished college, both of them went to law school, although it was different law schools. And um, so when both of them graduated, my husband decided that he would come to Hawaii. And they worked together for a while. And that's what brought us here. What did you think about coming over? Did you think it would be for a short time, I'll try it out, or were you eager for a different life? Uh, not, no, no. I think I came because I loved my husband, <laughs> probably. But um, it was a long way from home. A and um, the, bi the biggest thing was the distance from family. So this has been home for how long now? More, longer than, it was, uh, than Virginia was your home? About 46 years. Uh-huh. Yeah. Betty White had taught third grade at the only Catholic school in Williamsburg before following her husband to Hawaii. After moving here and having three children, she decided it was time to start teaching again. She landed a job at Sacred Hearts Academy in Kaimuki. You've been there for more than four decades. I have. Um, and the school's changed a lot in those four decades. I was hired as a social studies teacher, and I love teaching. I'd never been um, in a private school before. Um, I loved working in a religious environment. I loved working with the nuns, and um, I just loved working with the girls. I enjoyed, I, I still think of myself as a teacher, although I've been out of the classroom for about 20 years. Are you Catholic? No. And not required to be to be head of Sacred Hearts? Uh, well, at, when I was appointed as head of school, um, I, it was not a factor. I think that my replacement will probably be required to be Catholic. Did you aspire to be head of school? No, no. Uh, um, what happens is in, in many Catholic schools, there are just fewer and fewer religious. So the religious look to what we call the laity or lay people like myself to take over some of the positions. And at that time, um, the, the sister that I replaced was going to be assigned to other places. And, and first I went in as a vice principal. So I was a vice principal for about, oh, I'd say eight years and then finally as, um, as the head of school. Now there are lots of lay people that are in either as principals or heads of school and it's become quite common for the, the boards to require them to be Catholic. Was it a topic of conversation or a contention that you were not Catholic? No, I'm very comfortable with it. It um, certainly forces me to have a good team with me. We have a, a full-time campus minister who is a, a, a sister. Uh, the chair of our religion or theology department is a sister. So I feel very comfortable. Let's talk about all girls education. Okay. You, you've written a number of essays and articles about the subject. Um, and you know, you, you've heard people say, well, there's no, there, there's no need for it anymore. Girls should get used to the, the you know, business and, and other environments where it's gonna be, you know, you're gonna be with, with the, the opposite sex. Well, what do you say? I think a lot of it's personal, uh, but I've spent, I've spent a good portion of my of my career in an all-girls school, I attended an all-women's college. I think that uh, boys and girls learn differently. Not, you know, girls don't learn better, they don't learn worse, but they, they definitely learn differently. Uh, girls thrive in a, in a um, collaborative, reflective, um, experiential environment. And it just so happens in a girl's school, and it was the same in a single gender for boys. 
that our teachers are trained to teach to those learning styles, and they thrive. The, uh, we have uh, we have huge numbers of our girls going into science, going into math, going into pre-engineering. And you don't think they would if there were boys in the school? Uh, I, th I think some of them would, but I think that um, uh, that doors are open to them. We stress it. You know, we, we emphasize it from the time they are in ninth grade that they need to check out these fields. And they feel very comfortable in math and science. Um, if it's, a lot of it's experiential today, uh, a lot of reflective learning going on. Boys, not so much experiential because they have, uh, especially if you're in science, if you're in physics, a lot of the things they do in childhood give them a, a sort of an edge when they start applying that to book learning. But a lot, of, a lot of the girls have not had those toys. They've not had the robotics. They've not had, um, you know, how a bicycle works. So they need a little more attention in those places. I find parents today very involved with their kids' education. Too involved? Um, I'm not so sure too involved. I think that lots of parents understand that they are spending a lot of money. They're spending a lot of the family budget for private schools, and they're going to make sure that the girls and boys are getting a good uh, education. Lots of pressure on the school, but on the, on the children as well. Oh, it is. I think that uh, high school should be a time for learning, but not a pressure cooker atmosphere. And the, and the job of an adolescent is to, to find a personal identity. They're separating oh, yeah. from their parents' identity, yeah. and, and um, that must be, is that part of what you consider your job in the school, to help them find that? Well, I think, especially if you're dealing with girls, because with girls, the, the transition from adolescence and their um, personal identity journey certainly happens for the most part in high school. And they need attention and they need um, uh, adults catering to that and helping them with it. The big advantage to all growth schools is that it gives girls a time of their own to really develop confidence, to really develop confidence, to develop a sense of self-esteem. And if boys, but especially if girls, can develop that, we don't have to worry about the academics. Because once they've got the confidence, they can soar academically. So I think it's very much part of our job. Who would you say are some of your better known alums? Oh, um, the late Loyal Gardner. We had uh, quite a few um, performing artists. Noilani Cipriano, Kathy Foy, um, Mamo Howell. Um, Kathy Lee is an up and coming designer in the state. She's from Sacred Hearts. Um, and then we have lots of lawyers, lots of doctors. Now we're getting more and more engineers. So um, they're all over town. <laughs> Betty White credits her parents and later her husband Emmett as the people who've had the most profound influence in shaping her life. Now she helps to shape the lives of other young women through the leadership and direction she sets at Sacred Hearts Academy so that they too will have confidence to set out and achieve their goals. Mahalo to Betty White of Honolulu for sharing your story with us. And thank you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Aloha hui ho. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. I think it was the uh, broadcast journalist Barbara Walters who said, a woman can have it all, but not at the same time. That's right. Well, you, you've, got to, you've, got to make, um, you've got to make concessions, as, as far as I'm concerned. In order to get the, the task done of the day, I very seldom go shopping. But I, I usually get all my clothes online, <laughs> right? I, I love to cook every once in a while, but 
lots of times I don't cook. So to save my time, I will go to Costco and replate it and nobody mm -hmm. knows I didn't make it. Except now. Except now, <laughs> I told everybody. <laughs>